ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the greatest NZ live political podcast in the world, The Working Group. Hosted by beloved left-wing broadcaster Comrade Bomber Bradbury. With the best political panel in New Zealand media. Reviewing the week. Setting the agenda. Avoiding defamation. The Working Group is brought to you by Gravity Credit Management. When the weight of capitalism is becoming the event horizon of an imploding black hole, call 0800 Gravity and our team will get blood out of a stone. That's 0800 Gravity. This is The Working Group. Kia ora, Aotearoa. I'm your host, the editor of The Daily Blog, Martin Bradbury. Hashtag socialism, hashtag solidarity, hashtag depressed. QAnon, anti-vaxxer, incel, lunatics to the right of me, insufferably humorless, woke cancellation, lynch mob to the left of me. And here I am, dear listener, stuck in the radical middle with you. This is The Working Group, New Zealand's best and greatest weekly political podcast that isn't funded by New Zealand On Air. Joining me tonight to discuss the big issues is the greatest political panel in New Zealand broadcasting history. Our first panellist is a far-right Lord Voldemort (laughs) with political values that makes your average South American cartel blush. The last ideological peacock in a parliament of drab owls. Touted to replace Alison Mauer's stuffs me too columnist. Damien, all tax is theft. Grant, kia ora comrade. Welcome back to the show Kira. one word to describe the week please sir it's got to be wagging doesn't it i mean this this coalition is a dog with two tails it's just, <laughs> <laughs> it's, just it's, <laughs> that's sorry. the best you've got that's, okay that's thank good. you there are three reasons to vote for the national party Chris Pink, obviously, Nicola Willis, and our next panellist, Matua Jerry Brownlee, currently walking the I-cannot-comment-on-that tightrope. He's the mountain coming to Muhammad, the last semi-rational voice in the next government and fellow political podcast host, Matua Jerry Brownlee. Kia ora, comrade. Welcome back to the show. Uh, good evening. How are you? Oh, we are yeah, magical. Awesome. Anyway, from last time I was here, still <laughs> just the same stuff. Keep pouring out. It's fantastic. You just um, must watch- words change in that script and away you go week after week and, and, and yet not one cent from new zealand on air come on jerry you maybe, can do something about that maybe that's why well, i only like to say well it's a few years ago three or four times one word to describe the week please sir great blow for democracy being struck day by day <laughs> fair enough and last but certainly not least our next panelist is the greatest left-wing male commentator in new zealand now that chris trotter has gone winston crazy political strategist progressive oracle broadcasting giant the last socialist standing the mighty shade the bulky order comrade welcome back to the show uh one word to describe the week please sir acquisition yeah it's a, it's uh, apparently the prime minister is an expert on acquisitions mm-hmm. mergers coalition in nature, maybe not so much. Let's, Let's get into this evening's show. Issue one, Chippy ceasefire captain's call. Issue two, coalition coalition negotiation, negotiation games. Issue three, G and Biden's reproachment and impact for New Zealand. And issue four, grim economic Christmas for many Kiwis this year. Plus, we'll have a final word at the end of the show, which each panellist gets to sound off to see who can breach broadcasting standards this week. My money is on Jerry Brownlee. Let's kick things off tonight with issue one. Over the weekend... Chippy shocked political purists by stepping aside as the caretaker Prime Minister to speak as the leader of the Labour Party to denounce disproportionate Israeli force and to demand a ceasefire. Chippy said he was forced into this unprecedented move because the National Act New Zealand First negotiations are taking forever. Damien, you are not shy in defending everything Israel does. Do you need a cuddle after seeing Chippy's comments? Well, I don't believe uh, in a ceasefire. I think uh, a ceasefire was simply a, a victory for Hamas. I mean, a ceasefire, you have a ceasefire. At no point do those people calling for a ceasefire ever agree for Israel to uh, continue on the offensive. There is no need for a ceasefire. Uh, and I don't really care about the Constitutional Conventions. Hipkins can say whatever he wants. It's no means You've got no problems with that? No, I, I mean, I, it's, look, it's not a surprise that Hipkins is going out there to, because it's just it's just pathetic, isn't it? I mean, we have no. a, we have an existential struggle between good and evil, um, and Christopher Hipkins, like the other two people mm. in this room, are unable to comprehend that maybe in an existential struggle between good and evil, between people who murder civilians for the vicarious pleasure of putting a bullet in somebody's head, and those people who are defending mm. their nation against people devoted to its destruction, they cannot cannot, cannot get off their 
moral high horse and decide that there is in a fight between civilization and evil, you choose civilization. He's wrong. Follow up question, uh, Damien. How is calling for a ceasefire an anti Semitic hate crime? Because it's not calling for a ceasefire, is it? What you are saying is that they want the Israeli um, they want the Israeli occupation of Gaza to cease and they will never, ever, ever support the continuation of that attempt to dislodge Hamas. It is not calling. The, the claim, the, the, the calling for a ceasefire is demanding that Israel stop what it is doing and continue to allow Hamas to remain in office. It's, it's nonsense, and I don't, don't agree with it. Jerry, mm-hmm. National have argued calling for a ceasefire won't do anything and that Chippy is simply pulling a political stunt. So when will a new Act New Zealand First National Government call for a ceasefire? Well, let's be clear, um, since the election, there's been a number of uh, situation reports being provided through the Prime Minister's office, through Mr. Hapkins' office, mm-hmm. uh, to us, telling us on a daily basis how, in fact, we're viewing things. Uh, frankly, you get a lot more information if you look at the combination of Al Jazeera, BBC News, and a little bit of CNN. Mm-hmm. Uh, and no one can look at that and not be you know, moved by the plight of people who are on the end of the conflict. No question about that. But a ceasefire means a stop to all hostilities. Now, for for decades, there's been no stop to all hostilities. Mm. Uh, So you have to go back to it and say, well, what are the conditions that might lead to it? And one of those conditions, quite clearly, and uh, you see Qatar is working on this case at the moment with the United Mm. States, is there a lot of hostages? And uh, then, then I think, you know, you could have perhaps some grounds for some discussions. But in the end, don't forget how this all uh, came about at this time. It was that uh, dreadful raid into uh, Israel by by Hamas, uh, the, the killing of uh, so many people, you know, the, the concert, various other places. Now, sure, the response has been pretty harsh, but don't, don't underestimate the capacity for Hamas to use their own people, the people as are claiming they support, as human shields, putting them in the road of... Uh, uh, military activity. Follow- in the end, yep. you're changing terrorists, not another government. It's Fo- a grump bunch of terrorists. Follow-up question to that. Israel has killed more civilians in a month than Russia has managed to kill in two years. Nice. We are very clear about Russia's violence being a war crime, and we are universal in demanding a ceasefire there, not so much when it comes to Israel. Do these double standards serve the West or undermine the West, in your opinion? Uh, I think uh, you're categorising them as double standards because it suits the argument that you might want to run. What I would say simply is this. Uh, in the case of uh, this conflict, you're chasing a group of terrorists who are terrorising not only the people that uh, they've got their, their eyes set on, and that's the Israelis. They want to wipe out the Israelis. That's their, their mission. Uh, but also, you know, quite callously using the people that they claim they're doing it on behalf of at the same time. It's very difficult. It's not like a a war between two countries that you might normally see. It's a war between a terrorist organisation and a country that they're trying to wipe out. Shane, the Euromed Human Rights Monitor claims 4,150 Palestinians are currently missing beneath the debris of buildings hit by Israeli air and artillery Mm. strikes, which means the death total Mm. is now over 20,000 Palestinians. If ACT... National and New Zealand First are incapable of decrying the deaths of 20,000 civilians in six weeks. Surely Chippy no, no, have no, no choice. Come, well, there. yes. there's no way we haven't decried the activity that's going on. And that is simply wrong. When will you what call for a ceasefire? You're talking about a, a diplomatic manoeuvre around mm. a thing called a ceasefire. And it is oh. not straightforward and it's not simple. Of course it's uh, not. We have really said uh, we, we deplore the... the uh, uh, situation that's there at the moment mm-hmm. and we do want to see humanitarian aid getting there as quickly as possible if it's only a five-day window for that mm-hmm. then we'll take it i think that uh we've got to be careful in terms of the rhetoric that we use yes i think that uh hamas is a is a terrorist organization mm-hmm. um but i also think that terror has been struck into the hearts and souls of thousands of palestinians in the gaza and we've seen recent uptake in extremist violence towards the more peaceful folk in the West Bank. And so, you know, I think we've got to be careful uh, about the rhetoric. Do I support the ceasefire? You know what? 
brothers and sisters, if it means that hundreds, if not thousands, of kids' lives are going to be saved as a result of a bit of a bit of time out on the hostilities, of course I support it. And let's uh, let's look at some of the detail. What uh, Hipkins said that uh, not only uh, that he supports the ceasefire, but he wants the he wants the hostages returned. Mm-hmm. So there were some. So, so he accepted that there were some conditions to it. And uh, I think that uh, international pressure is starting to mount. We've got we do have the Americans, we still have the British, and some of the West Europeans uh, that uh, are sitting on the fence or opposed to the ceasefire. But I think the international mood is changing. Follow up question: Chippy is crap at bringing us a capital gains tax. Yeah. Crap at bringing us a wealth tax. Crap at meaningful cost of living solutions. Crap at real social policy and crap at serious environmental responses but has he done enough to keep the job for 12 months by coming out with this well look not not on this particular issue i think there's a there's a lot of water to go on the bridge in terms of will he last the next 12 months let alone uh however long this government uh lasts but i think it was a good start because what he was doing is he was securing which he failed to do leading up the election he was securing the home base on this issue because i think people on the left want to see fire and they want to see an immediate pause of to, the, thou- do, to the thousands of deaths that Damien, Damien ignores that are happening and on that, a d- daily basis. All right, so ask me this, right? Because, so bomb, bomb, because bombers Palestinians' going out kids' lives are not of the, at the same value as Israelis' kids' lives. That's well, that's uh, that's a big call for you to make. No, no, um, no, no. That's but, your view, um, Damien. Well, you put you don't put words yeah. into my to my in my mouth, Shane. But if let's assume for the moment that we can trust the the statistics produced by an organization that murders okay. children for the vicarious threat so, of killing so should them. We have, let's, okay. let's, no, let me finish my point. Right? If, if it is true mm. that there is a higher death toll in uh, Gaza than, the, than there is in Ukraine, why is that? What's causing that? The is density it, is it, of people is and it bombs because, being dropped in those dense no, places. That is, the, reason, yeah. the reason is that the Ukrainians fight a war using soldiers on the front lines. Hamas fights a war by using schools and hospitals and civilian infrastructure so do the Russians. to to no the, 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 the Russians, Russians are doing terrible things to the Ukrainians. Yeah. But the Ukrainians are fighting the out there in the fields. Yeah. So if but you we, are saying we, if need, you are need, if you are saying that the death toll in the Ukraine is comparable to the de- yeah, is comparable well, to the death toll in, ex- then the, then the exists. difference is because the Russians want to take out the Ukrainian military and the military wants to take out the U- the, you, the, the, the Russian Russians military. Are heading, are heading they are infrastructure. killing. <clears throat> They're heading civilian infrastructure. Yeah, but but if, you're, if what if what you are if what you are saying yeah. is that the death toll is, is exponentially higher, higher. It's, it's because Hamas no, used civilian infrastructure to hide behind because they because Let's hear it, Jerry. Go for it, Jerry. You break in and tell us how it is. Death and destruction through war, none of it is ever any good. Uh, We started this by saying, was uh, Chippy jumping the gun or was he just being political or whatever on saying this stuff? Uh, Look, there are huge international efforts. Shane's right, going on at the moment. New Zealand needs to position itself firmly in the camp of an enduring peace inside that uh, uh, particularly small part of the country. Mm -hmm. It's the size, the whole landmass is the size of the Kaikoura electorate. Exactly. So just north of Christchurch, up to about Nelson. That's how big, tiny. And uh, the the Gaza area is a much, much smaller part of that. So it's a terrible situation, no question. Uh, But look, you know, getting into arguments about ceasefire or not ceasefire, um, I think that's politicizing things here we don't need to. We just need to be on the side that says, uh, ideally, the two-state solution, uh, but recognise that there was one aggressor here that's very hard to talk to because they are terrorists. Thank you, Jerry. We have to move on, comrades, to issue two. All week, mainstream media have breathlessly and uncritically reported every sentence for Winston Seymour and Christopher Luxon, suggesting coalition negotiations are always on the verge of completion when the reality is this weird grudge vote against Labour election has resulted in three political parties with intense personal animosity against each other and diametrically opposed social policy trying to form a government. If you've ever tried choosing a Netflix film to 
watch with a partner you now hate, you can imagine how hard agreeing to a political buffet menu of dead rats must be. This has become the dance of the seven veiled threats and feels less like the formation of government and more like a hustle. Jerry, you can't comment on any of this, so we will make smart-ass comments and then do quick close-ups of your face for any <laughs> unconscious un- unconscious tells. First question, hey, first Thomas, question. Thomas, uh, yes. go, go back to that little comment you made before about Chris Hipkins being cracked at so many things. And then ask yourself seriously, is it right for me to say that there is a weird animosity towards the Labour, the outgoing Labour government? I think it's perfectly understandable. And I think also the, the, uh, the um, consistency of, of desire for a better New Zealand among the three potential coalition partners is much, much higher than anyone might think. Close up of his face. Close up of his face. Okay, here's the, here's, here's the second question. Constitutional legal expert Graham Edgler points out there is no hard rules or dates when it comes to the formation of a government. The reality is this process could last weeks, if not months, right? Well... I'm not Jerry. From a, from a no, no, I'm asking Jerry. I want, okay, I want, I want, I want, I want, the, the reality is that mm. it could be weeks, right? Well, you look at Europe. Sometimes it's months. Exactly. Uh, exactly. I don't think it's going to be. I'll be quite confident that uh, uh, what you've heard from three people today on tonight's news indicates not too far off. But look, in the end, if you're trying to put something together that's going to endure for three years, have the arguments about the, the, the sticky stuff right at the start so everyone knows where everyone's at because right. there will be over those three years, all sorts of things pop up uh, that you have to deal with on the spot. Exactly. Shane, these people do not like each other. If this government was a fable, <laughs> it would be a scorpion sitting on a fox's face, riding in the open jaws of a great white shark. If the negotiation dramas and microaggression mm. pissing competitions are this ridiculous before the government is even formed, how does it last three years? Well, I think I think with great difficulty. And it's not just about, it's not, I think, Jerry, I think sorting out a robust coalition agreement is important but actually what where governments tend to come unstuck is is the unknown you know perhaps another credit crunch uh the sort, sort of thing that we saw in christchurch where the 51 uh, sister brother and sister muslim were killed, killed that that's where governments tend to become unstuck but here is the issue fundamental issue i think this coalition government has got and that is that the economic policy between new zealand first and act is diametrically opposed uh, Seymour is a classical neoliberal. Peters is an economic nationalist. And it's really interesting that he's used that term himself repetitively over the last five to six months. And I think that's the fundamental problem they've got. And then you've got someone in the middle who uses as a political technique uh, managerialism that is struggling not only to balance the opposite polar ends of the policy, but the personalities. Damien, I, I don't know that you can say they necessarily hate each other. I don't, I've, I've seen don't. no indication that Seymour and Luxton, they disagree, I think, on, on a number of issues, but I've seen no evidence of any animosity. Likewise, I've seen no, so evidence of animosity between Luxton and Peters. There has been Seymour some, and Peters, you there have. has, there, there, I mm. mean, Seymour has certainly indicated yeah. some. Fairly, fairly un, uncomplimentary <laughs> views towards Peters. The least trusted but, person in New Zealand. But, I mean, and, and, and Peters has made some digs towards mm. Seymour. But oh, I, yeah. don't, I don't, I mean, the, I mean, Peters was here just on this uh, podcast and he said, well, you know, when Seymour came to him wanting help with the end of life thing, he did, you know, he threw him a bone and, and, and did him a deal. So I, I don't see that those are necessarily... Okay, uh, Damien, let's for argument's sake say New Zealand First Act and National do arrive at a magical place where this buffet of dead rats is agreed to. Even then, the details have to go back to the individual's boards. National and Act Mandarins will say yes or no. In New Zealand First, however, Winston's structural dominance of the board hilariously enables him to exert his influence and get the board to reject the very offer he's just bought them and force another round of negotiations on some petty point of New Zealand First principle. Winston will never be stronger than he is right now. Yes, why true. wouldn't he pull that stunt? Well, I think the reason why he wouldn't pull that stunt is... What does Luxton do in the event that a government cannot be formed? So at some point somewhere, we go back to the electorate. And I don't think that is something that Winston Peters would gamble 
with. I could be wrong. Jerry Brownlee knows Winston much better than I do. Mm-hmm. And and Jerry has said some quite nice things about Winston Peters on this podcast and elsewhere. He has. He has. So I don't I don't but I, I but I, I think a lot of people, potentially including Chris Luxon, don't seem to under don't seem to understand the power that he has. Because ultimately he's got one massive um, trump card and that is well, all right. There is no election. Hipkins can There's have a no crack deal. at falling, uh, mm. uh, forming a government, and if he can't, we go back to the polls. And I don't think that Winston has an appetite for that. Although I could be wrong. If this follow-up question, if this political threesome proves as incremental as Labor's was with Winston, and New Zealand First sinks below the five percent threshold, would ACT call an early election in the hopes of wiping New Zealand First out? I don't think so. I think yeah. Seymour. I think yeah. Seymour is quite responsible. Yeah, I, I don't think so, and I, 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 I think that Winston is. You're quite right. I think Winston will try and avoid uh, an election because if you look at the ho- historical precedents, not so much in New Zealand, but you look at it in say uh, Great Britain, where where the um, social libs had had a chance to form a government, didn't do so, went back to, to the people, and they got done over like a dog's dinner. I think I think that would play out here. And here's the other thing: is what we all know is that. Uh, election campaigns cost money, and I think if they went back to the people, the donors that were very, very liberal in terms of forking out for New Zealand first and that will stay home and keep their money in their pocket. Jerry, Jerry? your thoughts? Uh, well, you can't just call an election any old time. Yeah. Uh, so you, your point before uh, would act suddenly manipulate an election if, mm. if New Zealand first was looking like it was uh, on the back foot. You can't do that. Uh, you, there's a whole process that you've got to go through. Uh, and all parties have in a coalition would have uh, equal, pretty much equal um, call on that particular point. The other thing is that if there's no coalition deal uh, reached, and I don't think we're going to see that, I think we're yeah. right at the tail end of it at now, um, then, of course, Parliament would come together. Mr Hipkins would have to put a, a confidence vote in front of the House and he'd lose it. And then there would be the opportunity for others to fall. So it's somewhat of an ongoing process. We still tend to think a little bit uh, in the old first past the post days, which uh, are 30 years back now. So um, I'm confident uh, that the, uh, <laughs> like everyone else, before too long, uh, <laughs> we'll have, have new government formed. So I, 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 would... I, I wonder whether the part of the problem is that when these negotiations started some two weeks ago, that the expectations for settlement were heightened by Luxton. Uh, Rumour has it. Um, and really hasn't been denied that he put a low ball offer to both New Zealand First and act that is probably rumor. probably paying the consequences and a bit of utu because uh, yes. what we do know jerry has known probably winston about the same time uh, period of time that i have what i do know is that there are very few politicians that put these things in their back pocket and bring it out when it counts and, and winston's one and of them when i tell you what win, one of winston's key motivator in life is a bit of utu uh quick round when will the next government form jerry soon <laughs> Damien. After the next election. Shane? <laughs> uh, by Tuesday. I think Comra- I- Comrades, we must mm-hmm. move on to issue three. The growing geopolitical friction and fear between China's ambitions and aggressive expansion to the Pacific versus our own interests in New Zealand and the West have been abated. Following a very positive meeting between Australia and China, Xi has met Biden and has clearly shown the West that China's interests are economic, not military. The ongoing economic stresses within China are enormous and China desperately wants to do business with the West to enable harmony so they don't have uprisings from their own people. Shane, Biden and Xi's summit following Xi's meeting with Albanese has signalled a China wanting to avoid the conflict that has been growing. With Russia's war in the Ukraine and the upheaval in the Middle East, a dialing down of rhetoric with China is a positive step, isn't it? It is a positive step, but if you if you see what's happening on the other side of the political divide, and we know that the chasm is huge in the states, it's actually been an, a, a counterpoint and a and a calling card for the Republicans in terms of the support. Um, so that's that's the that's the one of the dynamical dynamical issues that that Biden faces. Uh, the other thing in terms of the geopolitical era here in New Zealand, I don't think that we should underestimate the inf- the growing influence in China and the South Pacific. Go up to Tonga, uh, have a look even uh, in, R- in Rarotonga that, uh, and in the Cook Islands. Uh, Fiji, the influence is growing and it's more than economical. I think it's about a social um, construct that is developing. Follow-up question. The other issue forefront in China's mind is the real possibility Trump returns as president yes, next year. Yes, that's right. Last week, 
Trump called, it's just an unbelievable mm. quote. Last week, Trump called for revenge, revenge yes. against domestic communists, Marxist, fascists, and hard left vermin. Vermin, Didn't that's he? what he said. Yes, that's right. As plans of mass immigration detention camps mm. he intends to build as part of a paramilitary crackdown on illegal refugees were leaked, would Trump's re election destabilize any thaw between America and China? I think Trump's re election would destabilize the, to the very core the United States of America. Uh, let alone the geopolitical issues that uh, the, the the world is uh, being confronted with, J- and he will be much more hawkish both domestically and internationally than he was the last time around. And the other thing is, Martin, he will put people in this place that are not moderates, as some of the folks that were uh, in his his key administration. I'm horrified by the uh, very thought of a Trump-led USA. Last week, a CNN report discovered China using the world's largest known online disinformation operation to harass Americans critical of the communist regime. And internally, China has embarked upon an enormous campaign to hunt for any Western traitors. Xi's language was refreshingly positive, but the realities of grey zone warfare continue at pace. Is the West getting tricked by China? Well, yeah, I made a com- comment down here. Trust the we saw with the Russian invasion of Ukraine right up into the very minute that he did it. Putin was denying that that was going on. Even we we're talking before about Gaza. Hamas apparently put an enormous amount of effort into convincing the Israelis that they had no intention of of launching an attack, and the Israelis uh, fell for it. I don't know that we can. <clears throat> I think it makes sense for the for the for Peking Beijing to create the impression that they are friendly and cuddly and a bit of a poo bear. Uh, but no, I don't, I don't trust them. I think that there is, there is an incentive for China to create the impression that, that they are no longer a threat. I don't think they have abandoned plans of taking Taiwan. Um, uh, no, I, I'm, I, I am not sanguine at all about the, the, the Chinese. Um, but in terms of what you're saying about the United States, I think the, the United States does not realise yet that its days of hegemony are over. Mm. The United States is, is 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 a broken reed. Their fiscal situation is an absolute unmitigated mess. They appear to have lost complete control over their their southern border. Their migration system is is an absolute disaster. Um, I, you know, you the, the stuff you see is very hard without being there. If you look at the stuff going through on the streets and the riots and all that sort of stuff, so if you, at least you're there, it's really really hard to put it in context. And there's a bit of sensationalism, I'm sure, going on. But it doesn't strike me that this is a nation. It strikes me as an empire in, in terminal decline. Jerry, nobody wants conflict in the Pacific. We have a leadership role to play here and a dynamic relationship with China and America that demands attention. How can New Zealand capitalise on this new thaw between China and America? Your thoughts? Oh, well, I don't know. It's a matter of uh, particularly capitalising on that. We've had a, an independent position on uh, how we view China and the relationship that we have with China. And remember that as we all sit here, uh, tens of thousands of New Zealanders will go to work tomorrow to jobs that are entirely dependent uh, on the trading relationship between True. New Zealand and China. Mm. That's just the reality of, of the life that we live. Uh, so as a side to that, uh, we do need to look at uh, other big markets and we've made it quite clear that we'll put a big effort into uh, India as a potential market. It'll take a long time, uh, but we've got to look elsewhere as well to cover our bases. Uh, on the Pacific, I was up at the uh, Pacific Island Forum just recently. Uh, the Chinese presence wasn't particularly uh, strong there. Uh, the US was. Uh, remember that uh, China went round the Pacific with a, a, a list of offerings for Pacific governments. Uh, the most uh, compelling one, I think, was the 6,000 places every four years exponentially, so a multiple over that time uh, uh, of uh you know, tertiary training places mm. inside China. Uh, very, very, um, uh, you'd say, have to say, quite um, enticing for some of those governments. Um, they do have uh, a number of, of outstanding loans in the Pacific. Uh, what struck me, though, is that when you look at the quantum of all of those loans, it's not huge. We had 17 countries outside of the Pacific Island uh, Forum members come to the Pacific Island Forum uh, because they're interested in this so-called, uh, you know, standoff between the United States and China, all of them came with uh, the offer of, of funding, etc. Somehow, I think there's a role for New Zealand to 
uh, corral up some of that, keep, keep that big world, that uh, you know, goodwill that's around the world, uh, and to deal responsibly with some of the debt pictures. You can't just forgive it because otherwise you'll be back where you were uh, before they were started. But there, there are some arrangements that I'm sure that can be made. I think also then uh, not rushing to make uh, China an enemy before it actually becomes one. And I think uh, Damien's position saying, well, you've got to keep your eyes open. Yeah, you do, without a doubt. But, um, uh, you know, I, I think the, the days of the world relying on the United States are uh, not as strong these days as they could have been. Mm. I would say, though, that there is a country with massive debt, massive debt, uh, still finding billions of dollars for Ukraine, billions of dollars for Israel, uh, and participating in, in so many other activities around the world. Still a very, very strong uh, country internationally. Um, and as for the uh, prospect of the Trump government, well, let's just see whether the United States people actually do go down that track or not. I think um, what would worry me, what worries me more is the state of the political parties, uh, where you know the Democrats uh, seem to be quite wedded uh, to Joe Biden, uh, and the, uh, the the Republicans seem to be incapable of finding people that would be attractive enough to um, uh, to, to defeat Biden. Follow up is, question. Follow up question, Jerry. Infrastructure New Zealand, which is dominated by interests comprising the China Construction Bank, Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, and the Bank of China, have called on the new government to, and I quote, seek alternative funding and financing mechanisms to deliver infrastructure projects. That is a clear pitch for Chinese construction and financing. Will the New Zealand government touch what many claim is a Chinese debt trap to fill all those potholes Simeon Brown once filled in? Uh, no, we'd use um, asphalt much better than. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, all that all that organisation has done is is virtually parrot what we've put out in our manifesto. But there are no no commitments in that about where you would go uh, for funding or how you'd fund. All we're saying is that the current pay as you go model uh, is is not working. It hasn't worked for some time. In fact, last time we were in government, we had to top up uh, the uh, then uh, Transit New Zealand. Um, uh, budget quite frequently. Waka Kotahi is, is working on forward debt, etc. I think, you know, it's sort of all, it's relatively small amounts and you have to work out what your pipeline is over a, a couple of decades ahead. And I don't right. actually think you find too much uh, uh, pushback on that from the current government who are clearly looking at something similar. Sure. Uh, comrades, we need a word from our sponsor. Our sponsor, our long-suffering but exceptionally loyal sponsor is Gravity Credit Management. And I was... Uh, chatting to uh, Andrew Kingston of Gravity Credit Management at the end of last week, uh, and I asked him why why would a company that has their own internal credit controller hand over the collection of their debtors to a third party? And he explained, well, New Zealanders, we, we do like a bit of a DIY approach. We, we really do. But at the end of the day, collecting debt from people who don't want to pay is a skill. It's a skill. And there is, a, there is an understanding of the psychology of the person on the other end of the phone. And the key thing Andrew pointed out is that every call collecting debt is a sales call. Somebody closes. It's either the collector because they get a commitment or it is the debtor because they avoid making a, a commitment. And that is something that you learn over time, and it's one of the things that Gravity Credit Management spends a lot of time treating and training their staff. It's one of the reasons why Gravity Credit Management, like other debt collectors to be fair, but why Gravity Credit Management has a better success rate than a lot of internal credit controllers. If you've got some bad debts and they're not paying you and there's cash on your ledger, Give Andrew a call on 0800 Gravity or go to gravitycredit.co.nz and Andrew Kingston is standing by to take your call. Comrades, we must move on to issue four. Retailers are pointing to grim figures showing spending before Christmas has plummeted with many Kiwis saying they can't afford Christmas this year. Hospitality has noticed a severe downturn in trade as the majority of mortgagee holders rolled over last month from 3% to 7% mortgage hikes that are gutting the middle class. It looks like a grim 
grim economic Christmas for many Kiwis this year. Damien, you are the anti-Santa Claus who takes presents from poor children and gives them to rich Act Party children. Is this Christmas going to be the one that sees liquidations and receiverships jump? I have confidently been predicting a recession for the last seven years. So How's it going? I think, uh, I think um, I've, I've, it's like the guy, sta- like Canute, standing on the beach predicting the tsunami. I haven't even got my ankles wet. So I, I don't know. I'll give one bit of anecdotal evidence. So one of the things we do is we, we sell fireworks uh, every year. We've got at our warehouse on the North Shore, we, we, we flog fireworks. Um, uh, last few years, we've done forty to forty-five thousand dollars. We did thirty-five thousand this year, and uh, and the word on the street is that that was pretty common across the the entire fireworks sector. I was speaking to somebody in the events industry last week, and they were saying that um, on some of the the big events that they've got, where people have purchased tickets three four months ago, so they're they're still turning up because they got the tickets, mm. but they're not buying the ice creams and they're not buying the beer, and so the people who are there hoping to make a bit of money on the way through, they the they are starting to hurt discretionary income. Anecdotally, is definitely hurting. Although I, I've, I haven't seen any fundamental economic data on it yet. Uh, Jerry, what can the new government tell all those Kiwis just hanging on by their fingernails this Christmas? Uh, well, there are so many things that uh, need to be done to sort out why we've got into this situation. Uh, Nicola um, Willis has made it clear that she'll be having a mini with uh, an emphasis on the word mini budget. Mm. Uh, part of it is getting government expenditure itself under control. Uh, and, uh, you know, your, your interest rates, for example, are a direct consequence of government uh, borrowing, government debt, uh, government uh, uh, poor expenditure. So um, we, we're certainly going to look at that. There's no question that things are tough out there for people at the moment. And it, it's also odd because you sort of see uh, people struggling in, in so many ways. But then you look at the ticket price for that Seinfeld concert that's coming up next year, somewhere between four fifty and eight hundred. Is it? That'll be you'll be in the front row, of course. Paying <laughs> I pay. I pay that only. For, I've, I'll pay for Dave Chappelle, not. Uh, uh, Shane, not this good. Christmas feels like yeah. Elvis singing in the ghetto. Six hundred thousand require food banks each month. Three hundred thousand. Yep. Three hundred thousand face energy and housing mm-hmm. poverty, and twenty four thousand languish on the social housing wait list. What will Christmas look like for those far notice? Well, I think it's going to get a lot tougher before it gets any better. R- rents are increasing. Property prices are going up again. Mm. Uh, but, you know, there seems to be probably not any real relief in terms of mortgage rates probably for the next 80, 89 months. Having said that, banks are doing well, aren't they? Banks are doing well. Banks are doing well. I'm really surprised. Supermarkets are doing well. The monopolies and the oligopolies. <laughs> they're, 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 they're doing very well. The people well. Jerry's promising yeah. he will uh, bring in and yeah. rein in this and, new government and, and stop uh, those. I, I'm not monopolies. sure. I'm not sure what the income strategy for the new coalition government will be because I don't think it'll be based on foreign buyers and their similar. <laughs> <foreign dollars. laughs> I, don't, I don't think it'll be. I don't think it'll be based on, on that at all. And I think what they would want to do is that they would probably want to change some of those tax bracket um, because there has been some real creep in that but I just don't think there's the uh, affordability to do that anytime soon so I don't see I don't see hope on the horizon and actually what really does concern me is the uh, increasing numbers of uh, folks that are unemployed and I think we're going to see six seven percent within the next five or six months yeah. and the sad reality is for Māori and Pacifica it will be disproportionate you know we need a government and we need a government and now Jerry 40 workers in Gisborne lost their jobs all right they're going to be out of work before uh, before the new year um, no hope on the horizon in terms of government help, government assistance, or even a level of intervention that you may have got out of a form government and perhaps a, a, a um, provincial growth fund. Go on, and, and yet, and yet, I'm so surprised mm. by this because we've had six years of the. Of, oh, don't wound no. me. I Why mean, are you doing I mean, this? Why six, do you hurt me I, like I, this? I, I, Why I, I, do you I, hurt I, me I, like this? No, no, Why? I did Why? not. I didn't it's, agree with the government's economic strategy or position. I, I, I'm, I'm, and we had yeah. an unprecedented mm. MNP majority. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I thought, I thought empathy would have been enough. I mean, I thought she cared for us. I know she cared. She had all of that love. If only she had any. 
economic yes. comprehension only, at all. I know, if I only know. she understood well, how the economy works. Yes, if yes. only she okay. understood mm-hmm. how the Reserve yep. Bank should make yep. the function. I know, if yes, only yes. she could have do anything to control inflation. If only she had any skill. If only she was listening to Jerry. If only she was listening to Jerry. Jerry? Yeah, just, David, be kind to yourself. Stop <laughs> <laughs> Comrades, we must wrap the show with a final word. Damien Grant, your final word this week, please. Sir. I've been watching with some dismay the utter ineptitude of Rishi Sunak. I had so much. <laughs> I was a bit disappointed when Liz Trust blew up because I thought I just she should have just stuck it out, but whatever. Um, cutting cutting taxes without cutting expenditure was a just oh my goodness what an idiot <laughs> come on come on you want to be Margaret Thatcher Margaret Thatcher cut spending but all right we got we got Sunak and he was a fiscal conservative and blah 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 the latest two policy initi- initiatives of this I, he's not a conservative I don't know what he is number one he's bringing in a smoking ban right the, he, the, he's copying Jacinda Ardern's idiotic paternalistic approach that the government knows best. Okay, all right, fine. Utter dis- dis- dismay. And then he's bringing back David Cameron. The, the, I mean, <laughs> David Cameron did a lot of things that I quite like, right? He did some good stuff in education and all the rest of it. But it's, he is just, he doesn't seem to know where he's going. It's almost like he's, he's given up. So we've had, what, 13 years of conservative rule, is it, um, uh, Jerry? Yep. And, and this this is what worries me going forward in New Zealand. We cannot afford to repeat the lost opportunities of what has happened in the United Kingdom. We can't afford to miss the, to, to rerun the lost opportunities that we had on, on, under John Key. So that um, I'm looking at that and I'm, and I'm slightly uh, worried. Thank you. Jerry, your final word this week, please, sir. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll go off that hard politics, but uh, don't disagree with a lot of what Damien said. Uh, Fish, I just want to uh, take an opportunity to mention all the outgoing MPs and those yeah. who were candidates in the last election. Mm-hmm. Public service is important Amen. and often not valued in this country. So I, I just uh, pass my, my respects to those who were candidates, unsuccessful, and those who are MPs who are also unsuccessful. Well said. Then I would say just watch over the next couple of weeks for the outrage that you're bound to see expressed by the media is some of the current government's uh, initiatives and programs are put to rest. It'll be unbelievable. They'll do that without one instance of reflecting that many of those programs have got us into the cart that we're in at the moment. And we just talked about 600,000 people going to food banks. Dear me, uh, if what we were doing was good, then we wouldn't have that situation going on. Uh, you know, and ironically, it was a Labour government that recognised that New Zealanders like choice. We were a very, very controlled country for a long, long time. Uh, they lifted the lid on it. They gave New Zealanders that choice. And I think part of the problem that they've got is that they began to eke that choice back. So, yep, you're right to call on, uh, uh, call out Richie Sunak for that, uh, you know, let's all save the, the, the Conservative government by bringing in a smoking ban. What a load of rubbish. People like freedom. And I think uh, one of the things that you'll see coming from the uh, uh, coalition government when it uh, puts the program out there is a recognition that that is a factor that has to be taken into account even if you're bringing in prohibitive laws. So it yeah, uh, won't be too long. We'll be there. That's very interesting. Thank you. Jerry Shane, your final word? 30 years ago, we capitulated to the Tory government under, in, in terms of the Employment Contracts Act. We saw the deregulation on the, lab, the labour market. We saw productivity go down. We saw unemployment rise. Mm. And we saw generational poverty that we've never witnessed in this nation again. This government, uh, one of their... Uh, top agendas, I believe, will be further deregulation of the labour market. Hope so. the, ch- the left must organise, must combat it, and we must not allow uh, workers' rights to be stripped away with the fight. And we got it, and it's I think it's the fight of our generation. Preach, amen, Damien. Um, if you like what Shane has to say, um, I want you to go <laughs> into the bathroom. <laughs> Have a look at the mirror and just think really hard about the decisions in your life that have led you to that point. What a disaster. However, if you want to get more of Shane Drekin, you can catch him on Twitter at Shane, T-E-P-O-U. If you like what Jerry Brownlee has to say, um, uh, all you have to do is just wait and wait and wait a little bit longer and, and wait and 
I saw um, Liam here had a really funny oh. quip. Oh, that's not true. That's not, no, that. now I know you're lying. Because yeah. Liam here has nothing funny to say. Oh. Liam here had a really oh, funny joke. Jesus. Do, 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 do you remember that Greek, I think it's uh, the, the Zeno uh, paradox, is that you, you're, you're, you're covering a mile. And and every iteration you cover half the distance. So you know you. you oh, this you is hilarious already. Meters. The Zeno paradox. And, Tell us and more. Then, and then oh, two hundred and fifty, and then one hundred and twenty-five. He described these coalition negotiations as like the Zeno paradox. You get closer, you get closer, you never get there. If you oh, like, that was what, hilarious. If you that like, was hilarious. If you like, <laughs> humor. It's thirty <laughs> seconds. I'm never getting back in my life. Jesus, Your Liam life is here. Liam <laughs> here as the come Go, oh Jesus. Christ. Um, if you like what Jerry has got to say, you can also catch uh, Jerry Brownlee on Twitter, and also Jerry has a podcast. What's your podcast called, Jerry? No, it's in, it's in, it's in uh, hiatus. It's in hiatus. Yes. It's in, hi in hiatus, so that's a good, any of your podcast and just enter in, in hiatus, and you will find Jerry's podcast. It's great. No, yes, <laughs> have a great, <laughs> have a great Christmas, Mr. Speaker. He is not, um, no, Jerry is, Jerry is not, um, um, I understand from very reliable sources that Jerry is getting a senior job in the new administration. Spe he, speaker is the most senior not, job you can have in parliament. No, spe no, because the problem is that it's like a He's lawyer. measuring the curtains as we it's speak. Like, it's like a lawyer going to the bench. You know, it's, mm. it's, it's kind of giving up. I understand that Jerry wants to stay in the arena. He's a gladiator. He's a fighter. He doesn't want to sit there with a the gavel. He wants to sit there with a the Gladys. He's the only rational I one amongst um, them. I contract you guys for career advice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, because our careers have worked so well. <laughs> Thank you, comrades, to my final word this week. Last week, I talked about how global temperatures last month were six sigma mm. out from standard deviation. Hooten laughed at me being a math geek, Damien laughed at me being a science geek, and Maria Slade from the NBR did some actual research. I love science, and I read voraciously, but in no way, shape, or form do I have any actual training or expertise in science, and so I am no a sense. layman, and as a self-taught layman, thought everyone else would understand the magnitude of what Six Sigma was. Most didn't. Yeah. So please let me no clarify. Idea. The reason we should be shitting our pants over the latest global oh. temperature recordings is because those numbers are so high and so outside the norm that there is only a 0.00017% chance of it happening. It suggests climate change is exponential, not linear, and that catastrophic climate change could be upon us before the end of the decade, not the end of the century. If you oh. think being carbon neutral by 2050 is the solution, you are part of the problem. We are collectively dancing wildly on the lip of an exploding volcano and no one wants to stop the party. Now here's Tom with the weather. That was the Working Group, New Zealand's number one weekly political podcast that is not funded by New Zealand On Air. Follow us on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. We'll see you Tuesday next week for our second to last show of 2023 when we will wrap the political media year with Jack Tame from TVNZ's Q&A and Māori TV's Moana. I know, Jack Tame and Moana, and yet not one cent from New Zealand on air. Do something about that, won't you, Jerry? Kia ora and car pipe. You stay classy out here, now. Hooray! That was New Zealand's greatest weekly political podcast, The Working Group. Not one minute of this show was funded by New Zealand on air. No, nope, no creamy public broadcasting money for us. That was The Working Group. <laughs>